Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to part three of our urban rodent control webinar series. Today we'll be talking about rodent pest proofing. But before we get started, I'm going to go over a few procedures. Everyone, please mute your line. I've taken care of that on the back end, but if you come unmuted, please mute yourself. You can use the chat box to ask questions. For any additional questions not answered during the webinar, please email us at education at nola.gov. And this webinar will be posted on our website, which is www.nola.gov forward slash mosquito. Today's topic, once again, is rodent proofing and home inspections, which is a comprehensive look at the strategies for building rodents out of your residence. Today we have two speakers, Dr. Claudia Rigo and Timmy Madeer. Claudia Rigo is the Director of Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. She earned her degrees from Purdue University, University of Georgia, and obtained a PhD from the University of Florida. In 2004, she became Principal Research Entomologist for the City of New Orleans Mosquito and Termite Control Board. In 2006, she became assistant director, and in 2010, she was promoted to director of the department. Timmy Madeira has been working in the field of urban rodent control for 20 plus years. In college, he drove fog trucks at night in his hometown town of Laplace, Louisiana. In 2008, he began working at the City of New Orleans Mosquito Rodent and Termite Control Board as a general pest control specialist and is now working as a special projects coordinator. His primary focus is on commensal rodents and urban rodent control. Timmy has been a featured speaker since 2015 for PC Magazine's annual rodent control webinar. Timmy has a BA in history from UNO. And now here's Dr. Regal. Thank you so much everybody for joining our webinar this afternoon and we're so excited to talk about pest proofing and exclusion uh, which is a really important part of rodent control so i'm going to turn my camera off but um we're going to get started so for those that are not familiar with our organization we've been around for a very long time since 1964. Um, that's the picture of our building uh, that was uh, built in 2011 and uh, we started out with mosquito control but over the years, we've adopted rodent control and we do quite a bit of work with subterranean termites. Uh, we do all of the pest control for city facilities and, and quite a bit of work. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, rodent proofing and home inspection. So I think, you know, when we are thinking about rodent control, it really needs to be the entire package, right? So you've already likely watched some of our webinars on uh, rodent IPM and, you know, biology of, of rodents, uh, but we thought it was so important for us to talk about inspections and rodent proofing, okay? And so that's what it is today. All right, so here's a video, and, you know, look, here's a rat, and it has gone into a building uh, through some opening, either it chewed uh, an opening, but look at all the wires. And it is just moving around, doing its thing, chewing, probably looking for food. There it is, it pulled on a wire. Um, in this case, it, it may be a communication wire, but we have to be very careful, right, of letting these animals in. And there are fires that can also happen uh, because of rodents chewing on electrical lines. So very important to make sure that we keep these pests out. This is up in the attic where, you know, it's quietly doing its thing um, and people are, were unaware inside. So we're gonna teach you all different things that you need to do. So the goal really of this webinar here is to provide a practical approach for homeowners uh, for inspections and repairs and preventative measures um, in regard to rodents. And of course, we've got lots of professionals, uh, folks as well in this uh, webinar. So it's really for everybody just to, you know, get some good ideas for you, maybe things that you haven't thought about um, so that it's really uh, when you're doing inspections of your own home or doing inspections of the you know, commercial properties, you're going to keep this in mind. So this presentation isn't going to cover 
Uh, pest proofing for all insects, we're really going to focus on rodents, but if you're doing pest proofing for rodents, I assure you it's going to be helping uh, insect control as well. And we're going to focus on the areas that uh, rodents most frequently gain entrance to these structures. You know, every building is different. Um, you've got different challenges, so you're going to have to dissect each building and figure out where those weak points are. And so I think, you know, if you think about um, how important it is with pest proofing, we really would hope, right? And this doesn't really happen often, but, you know, if people would place an emphasis on pest proofing their homes and their places of work, a lot of problems would be eliminated, even inside. You know, these animals aren't going to gain access to get food inside. Um, they're not going to go in, to, like you saw that video of that rat up in an attic chewing wires. It's going to prevent that to begin with. And oftentimes, many homeowners and pest management professionals bypass rodent proofing opportunities. Um, and they'll usually say, OK, well, you know what? We need a trap or we need to put our bait stations out. So they're going to go right to control. So as they're usually their primary choice, their first choice. And we really want to stress here to you today that pest proofing should be right at the top of your li uh, list. And a lot of times people perceive uh, rodent proofing as this huge job, so costly. You need special you know, expertise to do it. So again, what are we going to do? We're going to try to give you some good ideas, some low cost methods. There are some examples that are expensive and very big, um, but it's important to know that you can often buy things off the shelf and they're going to work. All right, so when you think about uh, rodents and getting into gaining access to a structure, well, guess what? Sometimes we bring them in, in with boxes and deliveries, right? It can be brought in into a home or even a commercial facility um, with, with boxes and deliveries and maybe uh, just different things that you may have in storage that now get transferred into a building. Sometimes they move into a building during construction. We've had a situation actually in city buildings that that's happened. Um, and then also rodents are gonna forage and they're gonna seize every opportunity and often it's the easy ones, just literally leaving that door open. Right. Um, and so just leaving that door open, uh, we'll let them in. So leaving that window or there may be a gap. So we want to deal with that. Um, and again, rodents, uh, their body shape, right? So as long as they can get their head through that hole, there are the rest of their bodies going in and they're constantly surveying and re-exploring all of these different areas to see if there's ways in. All right, so I usually start by saying if you're going to do pest proofing, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to want to seal the envelope, right? Because sometimes it does seem very daunting. And so you have to walk outside. We're going to show you how to do those inspections and look for those tiny little holes. And in a lot of cases, it's a quarter of an inch or smaller. I'm going to show you here a skull of a rodent. Um, so that if it can get its head in, it's going in. For, ro for rats, we're looking at a half an inch size, but if you're going to all that work, why don't you go ahead and seal it up anyway, because that's gonna help you with American cockroaches and other pests as well. Rodents are drawn to gaps and holes and structures by scents, temperature difference, uh, differences, and curiosity. Later, Timmy is gonna show you some garages, right? that are usually warm. They may have food odors that are coming out. How about that door of a restaurant that's propped open and all those food or odors coming out? So those things would attract these rodents. We should always inspect our homes regularly for rodent activity, right? So we like to advocate that you spend 10 minutes a day walking around your house once a week, removing water containers, right? That would have water for mosquito control. Well, while you're doing that, take a few minutes and just look for rodent droppings and some of these other signs of rodent activity. So inspection should really focus if you're in a hurry on these rodent vulnerable areas. We're gonna show you that as well. And repairs and modifications should be made promptly, right before rodents really get a chance to um, establish and really investigate those areas and then gain entry into that structure. 
And so this is what I had showed, I talked about. If you can, if a rat, or a mouse can get into those holes, the rest of the body will follow. So we like the 35 cent rule, number two pencil, 35 cent rule. So you've got a dime. So any holes larger than a dime, a mouse can squeeze through. And then you've got a quarter, a rat will squeeze through. And then a number two pencil that you can slide underneath doors and gaps um, because they will likely squeeze through that space as well. And here's just a picture and just showing that point where if you've got a hole and sometimes these rodents, if they can get an edge with their teeth, they're actually going to chew it and make it bigger, right? Especially in wood or other softer materials where its head, its skull can come through and then the rest of the body uh, will, will definitely follow. Now it's really important, right? <laughs> um to really think about uh rodents and gnawing and their teeth grow continuously their enamel is really strong okay it's very hard um so it's harder than some of these soft metals uh copper and aluminum so they will chew and can chew through aluminum and these soft metals so when we're doing pest proofing we're going to show you some examples of using really hard metals such as stainless steel where they're not going to be able to do that and then also uh, we want to make sure that they're not able to chew and get an edge, right, and make that hole a little bit bigger so their skull can go through. All right, so when you're doing these inspections, right, there's going to be some basic things to do. So I, I think there's probably lots of folks out there that do uh, inspections of buildings. It is critical that you spend the time to do a proper inspection. If you, if you get sloppy on the inspection or you're in a hurry, I assure you, you're going to miss something. So with that being said, every structure is different and you're gonna have to figure out how big is the problem, right? And how are they entering into that structure? Where's the food and water? Is it outside? Is it inside? Um, and then where is their harborage, right? Where are their nest? Where are they nesting? Uh, it may be in the walls, it may be outside in a tree, I don't know, but you're going to have to really look for all of these. So, and when you do a good inspection, it's going to help you answer all of these questions. So, a good pest, look, good pest control is going to address the problems, all right? So, it's not about just going out, I'm going to put some bait stations, or I'm just going to do one thing for control. You're really looking at the entire picture. That's how you're really going to be successful in the long term. So you need to deprive them of a few things. One, food, water, shelter, and how they get around, right? And pest proofing, closing those openings so that perhaps rodents that are going inside to get food, they are going to be blocked from it to begin with. Very important. So you're gonna be looking for those signs, right, of rodents, uh, droppings and tracks and gnaw marks and burrows. And of course, this was a topic of our last webinar. So if you want detailed information, I think you know the best thing to do is uh, review that previous webinar. So we're just going to touch on some of these topics. All right, so let's get started and, and really just deal with the obvious, right? And the number one thing when we're doing pest proofing, and this is also exclusion, right, is to deal with your trash. And so these happen to be um, uh, dumpsters, right? It's wide open. Uh, they need to be closed at all times. That's the lid as well as the plug that it's at the bottom, um, because otherwise you're just providing a feeding source for these animals to come in and eat. And so just again, another examples of dumpsters that are poorly managed. You may have an incredibly clean establishment, uh, nice and tight, you think, uh, but you might, your dumpsters might be in terrible condition, uh, overflowing with food and rubbish. And so those are all food sources for these animals. And I assure you that they will be exploring and re-exploring to get into that structure that is next door. So dealing with the trash is as equally important as all other control measures. We've actually provided some uh, just assistance in education for our community. And this is actually the dumpster guidelines. It's a magnet that can go on dumpsters or we can hand it out to our, our public. 
And it's in cooperation with the sanitation department of the city of New Orleans, and it's really talking about the rules. We want to make sure that people know the rules, right? So that they're maintaining those dumpsters in the appropriate way. And then we also focused on educating and letting people know that proper dumpster management is rodent prevention. Look at those dumpsters, right? So they're nice and clean, but we want to make sure the lids are tight. And um, there are lots of rules out there, including touching on our state sanitary code um, that is very explicit on how dumpsters need to be managed. The other thing is open trash cans. So I think a lot of cities you'll see that they have open trash cans. Um, and there are many city, cities that are moving to closed system garbage cans. And so pick the one you want. You obviously want it to be durable. Um, but in this particular example, you know, there really is no way that a rodent is going to be entering into that dumpster unless it's broken or the door is open. So it really does a good job at keeping um, the rodents away from that food. So it is pest proofing, right? It is excluding that food source uh, from those animals. And so this is an example, actually you can use that, it's the same dumpster. Um, this is the Mississippi River down here. And you can see this path, and this is not a path made by people. It is a path made by rodents, uh, rats specifically, Norway rats, that were traveling to that trash can. And so you can't see the trash can, you can see the shadow, uh, but that's where it's located. And so clearly that is telling you that, hey, here's an open garbage can, and these rats are definitely utilizing the food, the, you know, whatever is in there um, for, for their resources. Now, one of the things that's happened over the many years here in New Orleans is that the roll carts were introduced uh, back in 2007. And I think this was a real game changer um, as far as excluding food from rodents. So before everyone had their own garbage can, things are open so you can see where there would be problems where rats would just go in and eat from the trash bags and they've moved to roll carts. We do do a lot of, uh, you know, we have to keep pushing the education here on keeping those lids closed because if it's open, it is nothing for a rat to climb up this can and get into the food uh, that's in there. So we wanna make sure that everyone knows to keep it closed and then also keep those bins cleaned. I don't know about all of you, but I actually wash my garbage bins um, to keep them clean and uh, no food odors. Um, and if you are cleaning them, a 10% bleach solution is a great way um, to clean those cans and keep those food odors um, at bay. So really wonderful as well. So then our RTA folks move to getting um, these closed can systems. You can see the city of New Orleans also uh, began converting them. So very important. Uh, you can see a bunch that are there ready for install some years ago. Now placement is pretty important, right? So in this particular picture below, so yes, we have one that's closed, but you know, really next to it, there's an open one. So we need to work with our other, you know, sister agencies so that we're placing these cans appropriately and, you know, in what makes good sense. So just, you know, pay attention to the details. So talking about paying attention to the details, this is a great example, actually. We got a call through our 311 system saying, look, there's some trash issues. Um, and actually, Timmy responded to this particular call. Um, he'll, you know, talk later. Um, but actually just going out here, you say, wow, you know, what's the problem here? Everything looks really in order, um, nice, and the dumpsters are all lined up. The, I think there's a couple lids here that need to be closed, but for the most part, where's the trash? But I want everybody on this call to look really closely, right? So our jobs on this call, everybody who's doing inspections is to pay attention to details. And so as soon as I saw this photograph, I'm like, well, I know where the problem is. And here it is, right? So, okay, I put a clip art in of the rat. <laughs> it's not a real one, but look at the hole. This is where they're coming in. So again, you know, you may have a site that looks seemingly okay, but it's our jobs when you're doing pest proofing to really make sure you're paying attention to the detail. So that is where the rodents were coming in. 
All right, so there are a lot of pest vulnerable areas. So we call them rodent vulnerable areas, right? So sometimes when we're talking pests, they're called PVAs. So we use that terminology a lot. Hey, where's the PVAs on, on those buildings? And so those are the places that you have water sources, right? Everything that these rodents would need. I don't care if you're talking about rats or mice. Um, food sources, where are your pipes and your wires, your vents to the outdoors? You've got doorways and frames. We just, I just showed you a door frame, right? That had an opening in it. Um, your thick vegetation and vegetation that's too close to structures. So different places of harborage, you may have piles of wood um, or other just stuff, you know, around it where these animals could be hiding out. So again, I think, you know, we really need to think about that sometimes our customers, that may be your client, that may be the building you're inspecting, that might be uh, my own house, you know, it's often really daunting, like, oh my goodness, what do I, where do I even start? What materials do I use? It's so expensive, right? And we've done projects in the past uh, through working through the EPA actually in schools where we were looking for low cost effective products and many of the products we used were um, laying around in your garage right some metal of some sort um, or we bought them at big box stores or hardware stores for very little money so one of the things that doesn't cost a lot and but is very useful is silicone sealant so we stay away from caulk because caulk hardens and it cracks and remember I talked about rats and their teeth, if they can get an edge, they're gonna go right through it. Silicone is elastomeric, is going to not crack as easily, and so it's gonna provide that better seal. Yes, stain, uh, stainless steel wool or copper mesh, Timmy's gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, metal screening and hardware cloth, just make sure the openings are less than a quarter of an inch. Uh, good quality door sweeps are concrete, cheap and easy. And sometimes do they have ready mix that you just add some water to it and get your little trowel out and close it up. Staple guns and drill guns and hammers and staples and some nails. Those are all things that you could use. All right, so I'm gonna kick it over to Timmy. All right, and Timmy's gonna give you some great examples and he's gonna walk through some inspections and some obvious things that we, we find. All right, Timmy, take it away. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, let me get, uh, let me see, are you guys seeing my screen? Not yet, Timmy. Really? Okay, what am I doing wrong? Uh, try this again then. Okay, now are you seeing it? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, awesome. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Let's jump right in. So, where to begin when you're looking for when you're looking for your pest vulnerable areas and your areas that need to be pest proof, right? Uh, let's start with what you can do inside your house. Basically, uh, one of the first things: figure out what they're eating, and if you can eliminate that food source, that would be great. That's going to help out. Uh, as much as pest proofing and sealing holes is, you know, consider eliminating a food source part of pest proofing actually, because it's not just about sealing holes. It's also about, you know, eliminating these things that draw the animals there and allow them to stay and eliminate hiding spots. We all have clutter or hopefully we don't all have clutter, but a lot of people do have clutter and you, we might not be to the level of hoarders. And we've all seen those tremendous houses that are just it, the daunting task of having to clean out a garage that's stacked to the ceiling with 20 something years worth of junk. And, you know, it's just a perfect habitat for these animals to hide in and they'll store food and keep food stashes in them. Well, even if we're not at that level yet, any, any little harbor that we can remove any bit of junk laying around your house or your garage inside or out, that's going to help you out too. Uh, it's not just with the rats. That'll help with roaches too. And if you're dealing with mice, mice will eat the roaches. So, uh, okay, frequency of pet feeding should be something to be considered too, because a lot of us have indoor outdoor cats or outdoor cats, and we'll put our 
bowl of food out in the evening for the cat. And we need to get out of that habit because a lot of times if you stay, sit and watch, we'll put cameras out on these bowls of food and we'll notice that it's, it's rarely cats actually feeding out of these bowls. And most of the time, it's it's a lot of times it's rats and mice and uh, possums, raccoons, even coyotes sometimes will come and feed out of these pet feeding, uh, which become like a wild animal feeding troughs, basically, where we're trying to feed our cats. And it's not just feeding the wildlife, too. These animals are all sharing diseases when they feed out of these plates. So it's sharing pathogens with each other. So another reason why we shouldn't leave this food out. But uh, let's change up the frequency of it because these animals, are, they're nocturnal, right? So maybe we can throw them off by putting out the food in the morning instead of in the evening. And yes, rats are smart. They will figure this out. But uh, it's every chance we get. We're trying to stress these animals as we control them so it'll be easier to throw them off their game. Okay, and our garbage should be placed out in the trash cans with lids outside of our house as soon as possible. Why would we keep this uh, these extra food scents in our houses to try and draw more pests in? No, let's. It, we're never going to stop them from going to our trash cans outside, but we can at least discourage them from coming into our house. So it, it's good to clean up as soon as you can. Oh my goodness, isn't this a lovely house? Uh, this is just perfect, okay? This is a mouse factory right here and a mouse machine. Uh, let's look at it really closely or look at it a little closer. And, of course, we see the stacked up garbage right there. It's overflowing. Uh, there's a bag that needs to be put out next to it. Uh, but we're looking a little closer because this is detail work. We're problem solvers here. If you were going to look for the animals, especially if this was mice, which this is inside of most homes, mice are king. I'm not saying that you don't get rats in homes. You do. But mice are more common. In this situation, this was a mouse situation big time. Uh, it's the stove right next to it because you have the pilot light in the stove that keeps it warm. So underneath the stove is dark. A lot of food debris already falls when you're cooking and moving stuff to and from the stove and the oven. Uh, so that's already providing a nice little habitat for these guys. And then you look at the garbage can on side of it, and then it just becomes a perfect storm situation where these animals now have warm warmth, shelter, They've got food delivered to them right there at the garbage can that needs to be taken out. And this is a kitchen, so we can assume there's also a sink. There's also a fridge, which also has a compressor that's a, a good heat source that mice and rats love to go hang out by. Keeps them warm in winter, and they even like the warmth in summer. And underneath those fridges and freezers, too, you'll have drip pans that'll catch water. So especially mice will take advantage of that. They don't mind drinking that nasty stagnant water. Uh, but yeah, this is just so many issues at once. But we're going to keep looking at this dirty house because we're going to even figure out how they got into this kitchen to begin with. So where we're looking inside, right? As I just mentioned, warm spots, hot water heater closets, under fridges, gas stoves, uh, inside of furniture. Uh, we ran into this recently where we had a family of mice uh, that were living in a sofa in a city building. Someone had brought us a sofa into their office and they didn't realize they brought a family of mice in with the sofa they picked them off the side of the road. Uh, and yeah, they, they can be happy and healthy in there. Think about it, that sofa's insulated, it's quiet, it's dark, it's a perfect little hiding spot waiting for the food that we drop. And then when that's not enough, they go out looking for stuff everywhere else. Uh, our dark areas, we need to be able to look behind things, uh, underneath things. So that's another reason to clean up your clutter because it's, it's difficult to do our jobs correctly if we can't see what we're doing. So we need all these things and we, if you're dealing with appliances and you're working in kitchens and things like, in places like this, uh, try to encourage the staff to put the appliances either on these, they make these little plastic discs now that slide on tile floors. Uh, but if they can get appliances with wheels already attached, that's that's just another level stuff. But, you know, that's wishful thinking. But figure out a way to move these appliances out on occasion so that you can get behind it and actually look and service correctly and be able to see what's going on. Uh, quiet places, as I said, uh, you know, inside of furniture, but wall voids, that's something we overlook, especially concrete hollow block wall voids, uh, drop ceilings, attics, uh, unused and empty rooms. Uh, and for the mice, a lot of times mice and rats will both do this. They'll, they'll nest in the, un, in the unused empty bedroom and just make the dash to the kitchen. You know, it's, it's maybe six, seven feet, maybe 10, 12 feet, and they're, they're happy to make the dash, grab a stash of food and come back. So, and you know, they go on notice a lot when they're hiding in these places because we don't look in these places. So I uh, already talked about clutter and what an issue it can be, but it's not just that. Uh, rodents leave pheromones behind, markings, uh, markers in their droppings and in their urine and also in their rub marks of sebum, as we discussed in uh, 
previous webinars. So it's not just cleaning up all the clutter, it's also cleaning up behind it. So please use a 10 to one bleach solution when cleaning this up. Before you start vacuuming or sweeping, spray everything down. You don't want that, that dried up urine and those dried up droppings to get particleized and for you to inhale that. Uh, you can get hanta like that and you get other rodent borne diseases like that. So we definitely recommend spraying it down and wiping it up. You don't go in and vacuum it or sweep it up because then you're just putting those pathogens up in the air. And also you're removing those markers to discourage these animals from returning to the same places uh, or new animals to follow too, because they will come back just like dogs marking in a yard. They'll smell a different rat, you know, a new rat comes in and he'll smell the trail where the other rat went. Same thing with mice. So it's very important to clean up the, these markers. Okay, back to this house where we were looking at earlier. And this is under the kitchen sink in this house. Uh, and it's lovely that, that it's just so well organized, right? And uh, if we see this pipe right here, see right next to the drain pipe, we see where the two water lines are going in, one on one side and one on the other. But we're going to focus on this water line right here where my cursor is moving up and down over. Because as we get closer, that's where the water line's going in. See, that's, that's the one we were just drawing a line on, and that's the base of the other. Well, this is where the drain pipe comes in that we saw right there. And look what the arrow's pointing at. That's a hole right there. It's like a, a textbook mouse hole right here. Uh, and if I like how when we look even closer, yeah, those are mouse hairs all along there where the mice, they squeeze through and leave behind little hairs. And I guarantee there's sebum on there, little bits of uh, pheromone telling other mice, hey, this is how we get into this house. Uh, this is not a tough fix, guys. Uh, this can be fixed easy enough if you just want to put a bandaid on a bullet wound, then uh, steel wool is easy, an easy fix for, for the problem. But I'm a big advocate of doing things right and doing it personally, uh, of doing, I'm sorry, doing it professionally. Uh, they make things called excursion plates. They work great for stuff like this. Uh, if you ever look under the, the cabinet in the bathroom um, and you look at where the pipes enter into the building, you'll see these plates around there and they can be loosened or tightened to the width of the pipe. And what they do is they seal around it so that uh, rodents and roaches and other things can't push through where these pipes penetrate at. So that would be a good fix for this, or even just cutting a piece of wood, and nailing it down, you know, putting a permanent fix on this problem rather than leaving this little ideal Tom and Jerry mouse hole for these animals to access your house from. Okay, as I said, temporary fixes to permanent problems. I have nothing against steel wool or copper mesh. Uh, the problem is that's only temporarily fixing it. And eventually they'll either, I've seen them push it out the hole when they were really hard up to get in the building, or I've seen them a more than more than often, uh, they're going to chew around it and make the hole wider so they can just go around this material. But if you're in a situation where you're trying to do a clean out or you're just trying to keep these animals out until your adenocide or your traps and your trapping uh, regiment begins to take effect and actually limits the population, then yeah, use these to patch up. But if you're actually looking for a permanent solution, these aren't it. Uh, and there's a downside to everything, guys, especially the copper mesh. Be very careful. If you use it somewhere where it's high humidity or where it gets wet, it's going to bleed blue-green as, as it gets wet. This blue-green film is going to come down. It's going to stain everything. And it's very hard, if if sometimes on the wrong material, even impossible to remove this stain. Uh, you get similar with the steel wool, except, of course, being, being steel, it turns to rust. Instead, of it gets a different type of corrosion and leaves more of a red stain. It's a little easier to clean up. But uh it's still who wants to have to clean up a mess right uh you know everything has its downside to it so uh another spot where they love to enter our homes at right the corners of doors and this is so easy especially nowadays we have so many different options for door sweeps on the market that are just phenomenal uh and in this situation though uh this is a tragic situation these are all in a french quarter which means we can't put door sweeps on these doors because everything has to be done to the standards of 300 years ago because it's a historic neighborhood. So hopefully none of you guys have to work in historic neighborhoods where you have to maintain the, the standards of a certain time. Uh, but look at where, look how common this is that these animals, this is how they enter our structures uh, underneath these doors. So yeah, if you have the ability and you're in an area where you can put door sweeps up, do it guys. I mean, it is, they can be game changers sometimes. And we're going to show some uh, some do-it-yourself methodologies for this, too, because it's not just the door sweeps. If we notice this picture on the left-hand side here, we can see that 
they've eaten away at the door to fit through better. I love it. See, we got that rub mark on the side of it. But you can see how it's misshapen because they've chewed through. Well, there are ways to, I mean, in a perfect world, go get a new door, right? But in a non-perfect world, in a real world, sometimes we have to make do what we have. And we're going to show you guys some, some shortcut methods for temporary fixes in a little while as well. But yeah, this is looking at, from the inside, what can happen? And these are in this situation, the, rat, the mice actually chewed their way out of a house. Uh, and they went through a wooden door sweep right here uh, through the corner of a door and made us a nice little typical, uh, you know, stereotype mouse hole through the corner of a door. So what, what do we do to fix this? We go get a new door, uh, actually that's a threshold. So we go get a new threshold for this door. And in this situation, I would definitely advise them to get a metal threshold because wood isn't getting the job done. Uh, so sometimes we have to upgrade. You get what you pay for, too, guys. Uh, we should spend more on our pest proofing because then you get better results, actually, a lot of times. Okay, I was talking a minute ago about uh, do-it-yourself door repairs and the corners where they chew through, and this is just a perfect example. Uh, credit or credits do. I didn't do this patch job. A colleague of mine, Phil, did, and he did a wonderful job. Uh, he just cut a little piece of sheet metal, a little sheet aluminum there, and took the door sweep that was already there and reinforced the corner where the rodents were beginning to chew through. And that was more than enough to actually hold these animals out. Uh, like the door didn't need to be replaced. And afterwards, you could go and paint over that and make it match. Uh, there's some other methodologies to this too, where you can patch things and, and make it so that you can paint over and it actually looks really good if you if you get practice makes perfect of it is what it takes for pest proofing and making it look great. But residential garage doors, oh my goodness. If you do home rodent control, this is probably your bane. And if you do commercial and there's a loading dock somewhere too, this is a nightmare in general. And uh, this, I love this nice little stock photo here because it just shows perfectly too. Uh, even the rocks aren't lined up enough. So if this door, if, if this door frame right here, let's say it's not filled and this is just a veneer on the outside of here. A lot of times that's what it's occurring. That leaves these great big gaping openings on each spot right here where the animals now have entry to the entire building. But it's not just that, too. Look at the base. At the base of most garage doors, commercial garage doors nowadays, it's just a rubber seal that comes down and seals tight. And, I mean, that's great for keeping out ants and roaches, but uh, it's nothing to a rat or a mouse. They'll chew through it in a heartbeat. Uh, I know at my own house... I've got a hole in a corner where the, where the mice chewed through my door sweep or my uh, seal on my garage door. And now they actually make some really nice garage door seals. Uh, if we mention a company's product, we're not endorsing them. We're just mentioning them because we've used them in the past and they actually work very well. But a company called Excluder makes door sweeps and garage door uh, seals. <clears throat> They're reinforced with metal and uh, they work very, very well actually at keeping uh, rodents out of it and stopping this issue. Uh, if you can see light coming through under your garage door sweep, that's a pretty good sign that it's not doing a good enough job. Oh, um, and just to show no preference to anybody, a company called Burr Rat is now making some really, really good door sweeps too. But these are high-end expensive items. But the good thing is they actually do work and they last for a very long time. Some are guaranteed for the life of the door. So each one's a little different. You have to look at that for yourself. But if you can't go the expensive route, you can go the, the quick route. For most homeowners, we don't, you don't need to go that expensive route. You can get away with just using the, the cheaper designs. And what we recommend for this is go with the brush strip, okay? That's your best bet for trying to keep the rodents out. When they try to chew into it a lot of times, they'll get poked in their jaws by these hard bristles, and that'll discourage them. But I've also seen them go, and mind you, it takes a lot of time for them to chew those bristles on those brushes. Uh, but I have seen them beat them on occasion. Like I said, there's no such thing as a perfect door a door sweep. Uh, but there are some that are better than others. So it really depends what you're trying to hold out. But like I said, I'd go with the, the, a stiff bristle brush door sweep. And I've seen the, the non-stiff bristles. I've seen people do this and get the soft ones. They don't work at all. Uh, it has to be some type of stiff abrasive bristle. Okay, and I'm going to get to take a break from speaking for a minute, and you guys are going to get to listen to me talk in a pre-recorded video. We're going to talk about dryer ducts, and uh, let's see what i got to say about it before I talk about something that I'm going to have to say twice, right? Okay, the sound isn't working. 
so, so I guess you have gonna... to select it. Yeah, you have to select it when you show the video to allow. Okay, videos. there. Then we'll start over. Perfect. Okay. Okay, when you're doing your outside interior uh, exterior inspections on a house, you're going to come across things that some people, it, they're obvious but not obvious hiding spots or entry points for rodents to get in. And they're right in front of us often like this. this here's a dryer duct, right? Now, one of the entry points is going to be around the edge of this. Now, that's pretty well flush. It could be better, but still, that's not bad. And earlier I had mentioned the pipes under the houses and putting collars on them and such like that. And putting things around you could easily do this on this but really what needs to be done is they need to have a bed cover which we all see them they're triangular and they come over like this and cut down and they have a screen on the bottom this prevents animals from coming in because house mice and rats will come in through here and they will actually enter when this cover is missing and go in here and they can chew through this like nothing to get access to a house and think about it like this this is blowing out warm air in winter so the, the rodents are drawn to that warmth and they go in there and uh, I've heard about times where people went on vacation and came back and the mice had come in and started nesting in here. And when they went to do laundry, they didn't notice till they smelled the smell. Because when it heats up, that, that mouse urine got very pungent quickly. So this is definitely something to look at. And you're going to have to get that cover for here and secure it. And make sure it has the grate at the bottom, like we said. Because this is a serious entry point for roads in the houses. Let's keep doing our inspection. Yeah, that was awesome, wasn't it? Uh, and it tells the story I was going to tell anyway uh, about the the horrible smell you get from dryers when you dry mouse and droppings in urine by accident. But guys, that is definitely an overlooked thing. And now here's some pictures we're going to show you. There's the outside. Now we're looking up at it. And as you can see, there's, there's a little flap in this one. You can't really make it out, but there is a flapper in there so that when air blows out, uh, it turns and allows the air to blow out and then when it's when the dryer's done it's got a little spring on it that shuts the flap back now the downside to the even these have downsides the flapper dryer duct covers uh if you you have to periodically go outside and clean out, out that extra uh lint that dryer lint that gets stuck on there because otherwise that door eventually will get will get stuck in a half open position and uh, that will allow for rodents to enter through it so even the best inventions have downfalls. Okay, boy, isn't this an advertisement for a dryer duct, huh? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? That's uh, rub marks and sebum. Uh, and not just that, that's also probably some urine on there as well. But we can see where the animals are entering your structure. In this situation, when you're missing the entire dryer duct and not just the, the duct, the hole where uh, that's big enough to allow in raccoons, cats, possums, snakes, rats, mice. Uh, maybe one of if the neighborhood kids are small enough. Uh, guys, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And it, like I said earlier, it's not just the hole that needs to be sealed here. That rub mark needs to be removed off the side because that's encouraging all the animals that have previously entered through this, through this hole now, be it possum, raccoon, or whatever, any of their kin come around and smell that. They're going to go, hmm, smell, I smell a friend. Maybe I should go investigate. So, I mean, this is just an obvious one for us that it needs to be sealed up and dealt with. Okay, I mentioned garage doors and the gap under them earlier, and I don't know if you guys can tell or not, but look, at uh, you can see what's coming. Yeah, there's my hand shoved under this garage door. There is absolutely no sweep at all, no, no seal at all on this, and if I can shove my hand under it, then a rat can make it under that door without even, it won't even have to duck his little ears down. He can just run right through. He'd have to be a pudgy little, bu uh, little, bu little buddy to, you know, have trouble getting underneath something I can shove my hand under. That is definitely a, a more than a half an inch. But guys, this is just like I was saying, we need to get quality uh, sweeps and quality seals for our doors. So outside where we're going to begin, let's move outside the house and uh, look for water sources, especially if you live in somewhere where it's hot and rain is not a frequent occurrence. It's not like here. I know in South Louisiana, guys, it rains often and a lot. So it's kind of moot trying to remove water sources, but I still do encourage it because we do get those uh, droughts in August and September where it only rains if there's a hurricane. So when it's 100 degrees with no rain, these animals get desperate for water. So why are we making it easy on them, right? If we have a leaky faucet, let's fix it. Uh, bird bass and fish ponds. Bird bass can be emptied. Fish ponds, good luck. Uh, I don't have a good remedy for that. Okay, random containers holding rainwater. That should be removed anyway. That's a mosquito breeding issue and a rodent watering issue. Our food sources. Uh, 
flower gardens, nah, some flowers rats eat, but in general, rats love flowers. They'll line their burrow. Norway's line their burrows with them sometimes. I'm uh, not quite sure why, but uh, it does happen. And vegetables and fruits and nut trees, okay? Uh, if you've got a pecan tree, like here in the south, a lot of us have pecan trees in our yard. We should go pick those pecans every year because if we leave them on the ground, we're leaving food behind for these rats. Fruits and veggies. Uh, we have satsuma trees here, and I'm sure those of you out on the West Coast listening know all about citrus and roof rats. Uh, that's like little beacons in our neighborhoods. Put And a lot of times we put them right next to our houses where, you know, half the year it's flashing. Hey, come eat me. I've got food up here. No, we need to go out there and pick these fruits and veggies when they're ready. And so we can take advantage of them when we can eat them. And even if you're not going to consume all that, pick them, throw them in the garbage. Don't leave it up to encourage these animals to come by our houses and much less just to feed them in general. Uh, bird feeders and pet food. Okay, I already briefly touched on pet food, but bird feeders I will briefly touch on as well. Uh, there's no such thing as a rodent-proof bird feeder. And if you want a good laugh, I always tell people, go on YouTube and type in a uh, rodent-proof bird feeder or rodent versus bird feeder. And you'll see some of the most entertaining videos of people trying to beat rats. And you, it'll give you a new respect for rodents, be it squirrels or rats, because the feats and the, the length of acrobatics that they perform to get at these bird feeders is just staggering sometimes. It's, it, there's no doubt that these animals are diabolically clever when you see the, the, the lengths they will go to and the just the amazing feats that they perform to get to these bird feeders. But hey, I tell people, why are we feeding the birds to begin with? They're doing fine without us. And honestly, they're actually very important in nature feeding on their own, be it whether they're controlling insects for us or whether they're consuming seeds on their own and using and spreading them as they defecate. So, you know, there's more to it than that. We don't need to have, and people, well, I love nature. Here's another hint. The birds are going to come to your backyard probably anyway. But if you can clean up, if you're going to insist on having a bird feeder, please clean up the debris underneath it. Otherwise, it's just, it's, it becomes a rat and mouse machine. Uh, and Claudia already spoke in depth about trash cans. So uh, Arbridge, like I said, debris, overgrown yards, trash piles, anything outside that you can get rid of, get rid of it. We don't need to have, uh, especially I love it, people here in South Louisiana, it rarely gets cold enough to have a house fire, but yet everyone has a pile of firewood stacked next to their house if they have a chimney. Uh, so many people don't even have working fireplaces and still accumulate large piles of firewood next to their house. Oh, those are, are you're, you're building rat condos on the side of your house. Uh, and also roach condos, because you find a lot of large roaches, be it American cockroaches, smoky browns, in these piles of wood or in these piles of debris. And that's a major food source for mice in an outdoor area, full of protein for those guys. Okay, I uh, already told you guys, pick your fruits and veggies as soon as they ripen. Don't let them hit the ground. Uh, don't overfeed. And if you are going to put out a bird feeder or two, don't just throw bird seed on the ground. At least have a hanging, at least make an attempt to keep the rats off of it. Oh, and chickens, guys. Chickens are rat factories, too. If you've ever done any work in a chicken farm or a chicken house, then you know that mice and rats run rampant in these places. And it's it's no it's no small wonder you know it's it's easy to understand why they get access to food and water easily all that extra chicken feed all that extra water plus rats and mice like to eat eggs they like to eat chicks and they will eat chickens uh, not so much the mice but rats will eat a chicken in a heartbeat if they get their hand if they can get their little jaws on it uh, so let's jump into that and doing some inspections around a house and what's wrong with things so let's start with our picture on the left and if you guys can't make it out, the furthest left arrow there is pointing to a bird feeder. And the arrow pointing at the trunk of the tree, uh, I realized when I was looking at this earlier, you can't tell because it's so well camouflaged. There's a corn cob that this person nailed to a tree. And they were trying to attract squirrels. The problem is there's no squirrels in this neighborhood. Uh, the nest in the tree above them that they thought was a squirrel nest actually was a roof rat nest. So when I came back at night, and I ought to put those pictures in here, uh, it was roof rats coming down and eating the corn off the corn on the cob and did they were decimating that bird feeder every day and then we look behind it because the next picture is actually their neighbors because this is where actually this was where all the roof rats were coming from the neighborhood pretty much that when i was working in this neighborhood that's a large live oak tree uh on the picture on the right hand side right and isn't this live oak tree if we look up high on it well first the arrows pointing to a bird feeder attached to this one too but look at these great big knots in this live oak they were a perfect spot where these rats were able to live and nest and no one could get to them. 
not easy access for predators. Plus the oak tree puts out acorns part of the year. So that's you know, a natural food source right there. And now the nice old lady who lives in this house puts out bird seed every day too. So we've got multiple food sources. And she also has a bird bath, which is a little mosquito breeding machine and also a rat and mouse watering trough. And they don't realize a lot of times that the problem will start small with one little family unit and then after a couple months of breeding and putting out more and you keep putting out food, those numbers are going to keep getting higher and higher until the entire neighborhood has a rat problem. Um, I just tell people, you, your neighborhood should own it. That's your rats. They didn't come from somewhere else. The problem started probably in your neighborhood and just blossomed into the entire, you know, it started with one neighbor and becomes the entire neighborhood's problem a lot of times. Okay, move on to another nice little problem house. And this one has so many. These people, uh, they must love rats because they just, they, 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 when they called me, they were like, we don't know why we have a rat issue. And I took this picture of their backyard. And let's start, uh, let's start on the right and work our way across. So this bottom arrow here is pointed up. That is a Satsuma tree, which I mentioned we have a lot of Satsuma growers here. So look how low those fruits are to the ground already. A lot of Satsuma bushes or trees. Uh, they're not very big, but they not very tall, but they do grow wide and the fruit hangs very low to the ground often. So that is definitely, but I'm noticing I don't see any fruit on the ground in the picture. So they must hopefully they're at least picking up the fruit as it falls or throwing it away. Then this next picture, they're growing a winter garden and in there they've got a couple of cabbages, but they also have raw leaf spinach. And in this situation, they had mice. They were living in the garden, but uh, right around the base of the raw leaf spinach, they had burrowed in the garden. It was really cool. Uh, then we go to this next arrow, this one pointing down. It's pointing out a bird feeder. You can even see it's still full of bird seed. Oh, my goodness. So they've got fresh fruit, fresh veggies, now fresh, uh, fresh bird seeds. And uh, we look over to this next arrow. And what am I pointing at here? This tree, which is it's a camellia bush. So it does have flowers part of the year, but it's giving the rodents access because to the entire structure, basically. OK, this is right against the house. These plant, these trees need to be cut back at least nine feet. Uh, and it's not just this. OK, how could you service this correctly? How could you do an inspection if you have a, a tree that close? You know, you can't get back there and put a station down and put your traps down. Now, we'll go to this next arrow, and that's pointing at, boom, 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 a chicken coop. So, yes, these people also kept chickens. So this just keeps getting better and better as we look at this property and as we look at this picture. And we go down to our last arrow right here, and our last arrow is pointing at this nice pile of clutter where they've got their P-Rog. And for those of you who are not from here, p rogs like a sort of canoe that we have, that Cajun people have. Uh, but they have all this nice pile of debris and, uh, you know, some ladders, some yard junk. God knows what that is and all this. But it's providing, look in there, you can see dark areas. You see nice little hiding spots and little crevices and cracks where rodents would love to hide out and nest. So they created their own perfect storm, their own little rat factory in their own backyard. Uh, now, let's see if anybody, I, I wish we were doing this in person because for you keen observers out there, you see those trees behind it. Those are all oak trees, actually. That's live oaks, too. So those are all producing acorns a part of the year as well. And if you really know your plants, that vine growing back there is a meliton, which is a type of uh, squash we get over here. And roof rats love that. But uh, they're not going to be ripe for uh, another few months to have to worry about that. So on to our next uh, lousy neighbor and what's going on with these people and why do they have rats? They just don't know. Uh, well, look around close and we're looking for details remember and obviously it is not summer anymore but that they still have that garden out and they still have peppers on their pepper plants that they've never harvested uh they're just out there left out for the rats to eat on and if you look close too, you see some shallots which i'm not sure if rats are big shallot eaters but that is another food source for these guys but also just look at the grass in general around the pepper plants it's overgrown and perfect harbors for our rats uh, mice would love it too. They've got grass seed and they've got peppers. And also, guys, uh, rats and mice don't care about pepper. Okay, capsation bounces off these guys. They don't really notice it. So they will come and eat your peppers. Uh, a colleague of mine, Ed Freitag, has ghost pepper plants in his yard. And every year, the roof rats eat the ghost peppers off his plant. So, yeah, it's, it's just not hot enough to stop them. Okay, our next arrow, we're going up on the right hand side. And that upper right hand arrow is pointed at. Guys, that's where our window units uh, has been installed here. 
And we're going to look closer at that in a second and zoom in so I can explain why. But just remember that arrow there. Okay, and now we're moving. Wait, go back. Now we're moving to our middle arrow, and this is pointed to that AC unit in this window. And why? AC units, when they hang out of windows like that, guys, they, when they're turned on, they drip water. So underneath, there's a nice, cool, clean water source right there where rats love to come and drink. Mice, too, a lot of times. So, uh, and we've got this nice alluvial soil here. So a lot of times when I'm doing an inspection, I go look, I'll look where that AC is dripping. And if it's got sandy soil there, and it's a little damp, you can pick out mouse and rat tracks when they've been drinking water from there. So neat little thing and something to look for in your inspections to, to see if you've got activity at the house or not. Okay, and our last arrow pointing up to all this all this damage right here on the patient's soffit on this house. This is giving access to, you know, rats, mice, squirrels, uh, maybe possums, maybe raccoons, even too, uh, roaches, all kinds of things can come into this. So, and this is one too, where I'm gonna say this a couple times in this presentation, Sometimes the work gets beyond our scale as professionals, and it's time to, to actually call in a contractor, you know, calling someone who, who does this for a living. Now, yes, we do do this for a living, and we do do pest proofing for a living, but I don't do siding aluminum or, aluminum or plastic siding work. That is beyond me. So there's no harm and no shame in admitting sometimes we have to get somebody to help us to fix the problem. So, oh, yes, on to more chickens. Uh, and I'm not hey, anti. This is yes. Claudia. Can you can you just double check on your slides and make sure they're moving? Are they moving now? Uh, okay, I'm at the house still with the white truck. Oh, are we you still are. There? Okay, great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, now I'm moving to. Now I'm moving to the next slide. Uh, hold on one second. No, sir. Uh, okay, where was I? Okay, yes. Then my slide now advance to the chicken coop. No. Like I said, I was noticing when Claudia was speaking earlier that the slides were about 20 seconds behind her. Did it advance yet? No. Try resharing your uh, screen. Okay. I apologize for the brief interruption, everybody. We'll be back up and running in just a moment. Okay, how are we doing? Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. So guys, yes, chicken coops. Uh, back to, to one of the things I'd really just like. I'm not anti-chicken. I am anti-chicken coops put out incorrectly. And look at this. Isn't this a nightmare in itself? Uh, so we see our chicken coop back there, but it just gets worse from that. As I said earlier, uh, the chicken coops a lot of times have chicken feed and they've got a watering system in there too. So they're providing two of the very necessary things that rodents want and also the rodents want a piece of the chickens if possible. But look at this. Uh, so their problems just combined it too. We're looking closer and we see we've got a live oak tree right there. And look at all this clutter on side a nice big garbage pile and all this bramble growing up and there's vines in there and all kinds of stuff going on so this is like i said they're providing their own personal habitat for rodents and i'm wondering why they get rodent issues uh and that's just the tip of the iceberg with this too because you know this is leading to roach and other issues as well if not mosquito breeding because we look close and we're going to see this root bin down here that's probably holding water too so another thing, oh my goodness, this one too. So look close at this and you see what my arrow is pointing at. Probably can't make out what I was getting going for, but guys, that's a tree uh, where it was an old tree that he left inside of his chicken coop and he just cut the top off of it and put wire mesh over it. Well, the tree root system was perfect for Norway rats to go and burrow in. And the funny thing is he had both species of rats in his chicken coop. He had Norways that had burrowed and were living in the root system underneath. And at the top of that tree trunk where he had chopped it, it had hollowed out over time and rotted and roof rats had started nesting in it. And uh, it's funny, roof rats came from this woodshed next to it. Uh, so yeah, sometimes we're our own worst enemies, but we need to look closer at this. And how do we fix stuff like this? Well, we don't leave these, we shouldn't do this to begin with. We should clean up our clutter and maybe Put some forward thinking into where we're going to place our chicken coops instead of right next to our wood piles and you know i wish it was an easy answer for this so on to other things like 
we have mentioned citrus numerous times and how the rodents are going to do this. And if you work with roof rats and you work with citrus and you've gone up to a, a fruit tree before and you've seen it where they've chewed all the rind off of that fruit so that it's just hanging there exposed. And, you know, sometimes they'll chew on the fruit too. I've seen it plenty of times eat the fruit as well. But a lot of times it's weird because they'll just peel the whole rind off and just leave the rest of the fruit alone. Weird, right? But we're looking even closer, guys. Look how close this is to the house. So this is giving these animals a perfect thing right here too, where it's just perfect opportunity. You get a nice fruit tree to come out and get a snack. And then look at this gutter. Okay, if the gutters aren't maintained properly on a building, a lot of times water will pool in them. And this gives the animals now a water source and a food source, and they can jump easily from there, from, from the tree to the building and back and forth. So these are things that need to be eliminated. Like I said earlier, nine feet, they have to be trimmed back. You know why? Because roof rats jump eight feet. And if you want to see something really funny, uh, trim the branch back when you know they're running it and jumping and then come back that night and watch because the rats don't know that the branch isn't long enough anymore. They're going to run and they're going to jump from the end point. And when they do, they're going to fall straight to the ground, hit the ground, and they're not going to know what's going on. They're going to live, uh, but they're, they're going to be really freaked out for a second. So kind of funny. Okay, so Timmy, we look at this. Yes, ma'am. Your slides are stuck again. Again? Uh, yes, Okay, which what are you looking at right now? Um, a backyard with like a what is that a shed in the back? Okay, so we're not even near the fruit tree anymore. No. Okay, let me fix this. I wonder why it's doing this right now. Okay, am I up? Yes, um, but put them in presentation mode and then you'll be good. Uh, what do you mean? I didn't, I, that's exactly what I did, yeah. Okay, did it advance? Got the house with the We're tree. Seeing... You see the orange now? Uh-huh. Okay, so we're done with the tree. Yeah, you guys heard the spiel with the tree, so we moved on. And guys, that's one of the signs that you've had rodents feeding on your citrus is when you get these nice little wounds where the animal actually chewed it open and started to consume some of the fruit. Another good example here, guys, is leaving fruit on the ground. Look, there's there's plenty of ripe fruit on that tree. He's just leaving it there. And like I said earlier, this is a beacon to roof rats in the area. They're going to come and they're going to feed out of uh, off this tree. And they're not going to eat there every night because as we, we've mentioned, if you listen to our previous ones, they like some variety to their diet. But that's numerous nights of feeding for these animals. Opportunities right there. Uh, guys, a little side cameo. If you notice the little dog with the fluffy tail, that's Leia, my dog. She got in this picture. So, yes, this is in my neighborhood, actually. So you're, here's a spoiler. You're, you're seeing my neighbors and what I have to deal with. <laughs> it's a good thing I like to work with rats, huh? Okay, are the pictures still advancing? No. Oh. What was the last right, picture? Yeah, I'm going to bring up the slide set. Or, Stacey, can you bring up either one? And um, we'll have you just say advance. How about that? Okay. Uh, I don't know why this is doing this. I apologize, everyone. We Claudia, you can share your screen. Early. All right. I'm bringing it up. Just give me one minute. I don't think we can do one of these webinars live without having something mess up. It's always that way. <laughs> always something. All right, Timmy, you should be able to see the slide. And I'm going to put it in presentation mode. Let's see if it works. Wrong way. Give me in one minute. Sorry, guys. All right. All right, Timmy, can you see the slides? Yes, I can. Okay, All right, I'm going to show faster too because I didn't realize I was, yeah, I'd eaten up so much time already. All right, so let's just go to that. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Guys, another thing we overlook, if you guys know what I'm looking at there, it's two things we're looking at right here. We're looking at there's water in that ditch. So this is, 
we need to make sure our houses and our properties have proper drainage because water is not just an issue for mosquitoes it's also a rodent issue this becomes a, a feeding area uh, i'm sorry a drinking area hydration station for the rodents of neighborhoods they'll figure out where this water is and this will become one of their stops every night if this is the only spot to get water in a neighborhood uh, let's fix this right if we can drain it drain it if we can't use that to your advantage when you're doing your control these are spots to fix fixate on. Also, uh, there was street garbage in there. So that's something else. Uh, clean up the street garbage when possible. Uh, any litter that falls out of the garbage can loose litter that gets thrown out by people passing by. Okay, next. Okay, you're gonna play it? Or can you play it? Oh, and it's like super slow-mo. Guys, you, everybody see that? Wasn't that awesome? Can we watch it one more time? See the mouse on the wire there? That's a coax cable. See what she does? She took a little bite first. Uh, she'd eaten so much and gorged so much, she couldn't even fit through the very hole she came through with to begin with. She had to widen it a little bit, which is Claudia said earlier, that that uh, quarter inch hole is all the mouse needs. Well, it's not magic, okay? They, they're not getting through because their bones are soft or cartilage. They're getting through because if the head fits, the body follows. Just awesome. And this is an overlooked point we're seeing there. Uh, drop ceilings when you're inside of buildings, but also that hollow block wall was the real thing I was getting at in that because we overlook them a lot. And a lot of times we put holes through hollow block walls for pipes to come through or wires to come through and we don't seal them up properly behind us. And this leaves great entries for these animals to come in and out. Uh, here's a great picture too. This is like a number one spot where rodents enter our structures. Uh, that's where an AC line runs next. And we're gonna show you what it looks like from the inside of the attic. See all that daylight coming in? Now, the person who did this job, we didn't seal it. And if you look close at this picture, too, you see all those droppings down there. They used yellow expanding foam to seal it. And look at the rat looking down at it. He's laughing as he looks down because he knows he can chew through that stuff like a hot knife through butter, guys. Don't waste your time with yellow expanding foam. It doesn't keep rodents out. And also, it holds pathogens after because that sebum's going to get on there. They're going to urinate on it. And it's going to stay in that foam. And it's just going to get rank and disgusting. If you're really in a tight spot, you can use... Uh, steel wool or the copper mesh and use the expanding foam and use it like rebar and concrete and that will hold up a little bit longer but even that you're still gonna have to clean it up after it's still gonna hold those pathogens and that's just a temporary fix okay as i mentioned with the hollow blocks these become little rat and mouse condominiums a lot of times because they have these little holes in them and then the mice and rats will drag in stuff and they'll line the inside so it becomes very comfortable and warm and perfect. And then once they get in there, they can get around anywhere in the building. So the weep holes too, this is how mice love to enter buildings. Uh, and depending where you are in the country is going to depend on whether you have weep holes on your house or not. Here in, in the South, we all have these weep holes. And this is to let our houses breathe, quote unquote. This has to do with humidity issues. But these gaps in a lot of times are a quarter inch exactly in size, which makes them perfect. So I tell people, use aluminum screen. In fact, you can go buy aluminum screen pre-cut now to fit in these at uh, any hardware store, or you can just do it yourself. Uh, here's a great picture. Look at it. That's six feet up. Those blicks, if you guys know those bricks, those hollow block center blocks, count them, okay? That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So those are about, uh, about eight inches to nine inches tall, depending which center block you get. So that's a good height. That's mice. They climbed up the center blocks all the way to that point, and you see that beautiful rub mark. And they found that one little gap where airflow was coming through this so they could smell, oh my goodness, and feel, oh, that warm air coming in and smell some food smells. So we all we used was aluminum screen right there. That's it. And we were able to seal these animals out of this building. And like we said earlier, rats can go through aluminum screen, so can mice. But if you put it in the right situation, the animal can't get his mouth in and can't get a grasp, so he can't chew it to begin with. So sometimes you can get away with using those cheaper materials. Situations like this, this needs to be concreted shut. Uh, and look at it, there's a beautiful rub on his hole on the right there. Uh, so we know the animals are using this for access. So we can see where someone came at one point and tried to use concrete patch. And if it doesn't seal quick enough or you don't use the right thickness or texture of your concrete patch, the rodents are gonna go right through it. So it's very important to, to do the job correctly the first time. Okay. Uh, I don't think the video is playing right. Why don't you go ahead and just tell them what's going on? I can tell you all what's going on. Yeah, that's easy enough. So, guys, if you could have got to see this video, what it was going to show you was 
uh, I was underneath a house and we're looking at a raised house. And it, uh, I love crawling raised houses because it shows you basically, you know, the guts of a house. And we're looking at where water lines come in. And look at that. You can see, look at that gaping hole right there. That's perfect for rodents to be able to enter. So in a lot of times that people who do construction, they're not thinking about keeping out rats. I mentioned earlier about a scutcheon plate. So they make things called pipe collars too. These things will go on there and seal around it. And in this actually, I'm shoving in steel wool and I'm using that to seal the hole. And like I said, that's only a temporary fix to a permanent problem, but it is just a good place to start. You know, anything you can do on your own is, is a great place to start. Oh, uh, and this awesome. I love this picture just in general because it shows the jungle that is underneath a raised house. If you're looking at it from a rodent's point of view, doesn't it look like that where everything's vines and branches? But look closely at this one pipe in the center. Look at the other pipes and you'll notice something missing from the other pipes. They're not disgusting like that one. And this is under a house. That's sebum on that one pipe, the center pipe here. This is the central traveling point right there where rodents are using it to enter these structures. Uh, so, guys, take uh, you could take traps and zip time to them if you want. Got to keep moving. Okay, so pipe penetrations. That's another thing earlier. Like I said, steel wool is another option. Uh, you can use the aluminum screen. Uh, they make a, a stainless steel mesh actually called Terma Mesh or uh, Polyguard makes a stainless steel mesh as well. And they both work great for sealing out these animals. Uh, they're a little pricier, but being stainless, this is something the animals can't go through. So spending the money is worth it in the long run if it if it's more permanent fix. Next, please. Uh, concrete. OK, this is the one of the real ways to go. But as I showed in one of those pictures a second ago, you have to mix it up right. You have to use the correct type of concrete because otherwise it's not going to seal right and the rodents will go right through it. Next. Here's showing what it looks like. It clean up after, guys. It doesn't have to look this messy, but I understand none of us are masons. And we don't do this for a living, but it doesn't take much to make it a little cleaner, but it does hold them out. Oh, let's hope this video plays. Yes, it does. So we've all heard about the rats coming out the toilets. That's got to be a, a myth and a legend, right? Oh, no, look at him, right? Look what he's doing. Or look what she went and look what she did. So, guys, that's a sewer kick out right there. Yes, that is not a myth. Rats do come out of toilets. It is not a daily occurrence, mind you. Uh, but it does happen sometimes when you're missing that, that plug, that sewer cap right there. So, and this is how they do it. And this is what it looks like when you fix it correctly, okay? No amount of poison or traps is as good as pest proofing this and sealing it. That is, and I love this too, because if you need to leave it open for ventilation or for unclogging, this is a good solution for that. Putting a hardware cloth over it and putting a pipe collar on it, that way you have access to it if you need to access it. Oh, this is a great picture, guys. This is what it looks like under the house where your sewer line goes through, especially if you have a raised house. Hopefully it doesn't look like this and there's not a great big gaping hole in it and a crack, but that's galvanized. And no, the rats didn't do that on their own. It rusted and then the rats came on top of the rust and went through it. So sometimes we need to call a plumber. That's what that picture gets at. There's no fixing that in, a, in any way, shape or form other than correctly. So uh, Claudia mentioned this already, caulks versus sealant. And it's because of if you leave that edge, those rats are going to chew it, okay? So sealant, stay gummy, and don't give the rodents that opportunity to be able to rip into it. Okay, next. Uh, we're sealing out airflow. This is important, too, as I mentioned earlier. Those rats, we saw earlier the mice going up almost six feet in the air from the ground. So, And that's because they were able to sense and smell and feel that airflow. So it's very important to seal this up so these rodents aren't drawn to our buildings to begin with. Uh, this is very detail-orientated work. Oh, window screens. Here's another great opportunity because people always forget about their window screens. And yes, rodents can rip screens themselves or they'll take advantage of rips like this. And once they get in, there's there's ways where they can chew in through that window easy. So when you're fixing them, uh, galvanized mesh is usually enough. As I said earlier, they do make a stainless mesh too. They also make some, some other things, uh, some other types of materials. I do not recommend the cloth at all, though. It will not keep rodents out at all. Oh, uh, next. Okay, we're back to the picture from earlier, if you guys remember, of that hang unit at the back of that horrible house. So uh, when you install these hanging window units like this, next picture, you're going to see the downfall of them. My hand can fit behind there, that gap now, because those windows aren't lined up evenly anymore, so there's nothing stopping it. So that means airflow, which is causing rodents to investigate, and they're also giving them easy access to the structure. Okay, uh, how do you seal something like that? Actually, uh, they make specific, I mentioned excluder too, but they make uh, they make a wire plastic mesh that would actually seal that up pretty well. 
but something like that is what you're going to look for. Oh, and this is an awesome picture. This is one of my colleague Phil's pictures. But yes, replacing missing sighting is necessary because if you guys can't make it out, those are raccoons hanging out in this garage. And that's how they access and ex enter and exit this house through the gaping hole. And look at this. These people want to know why did they have roof rats. It might be this might be where they're entering. Call me crazy, but that's a pretty obvious spot. So if you don't know how to do this work, like I said earlier, sometimes we need to get a, a professional. They can do it better than us. Uh, okay, uh, that's an, a nice AC line leading through. Uh, and we see another gap where uh, where we're missing fascia and soffit. Next, please. Okay, spots. Uh, guys, the, the little plastic vents look really nice on houses and look very fancy. And this is covering up a crawl space on a house and entryway. Uh, next picture, because you see this little hole right here, and when we come in closer, yes, the rodents chewed through it to enter. Uh, if you're going to use something like this, put a screen on the back of it. That way, if, even if the rodent chewed through, he wouldn't have anywhere to go after. That's the easy solution for those plastic vents. Uh, overgrown vegetation has to be addressed, guys. This uh, it, A human could climb these vines to get into this building, much less a rodent. Okay, and this is just a pathway for other animals too, be it roaches, ants, etc., Oh my goodness, now we're looking at this one too in this beat up rundown shed. And if you guys don't know your plants, that's an elderberry bush in front of it. So, and it's right on top of this house. So it's providing a food source, it's providing shelter and arborage, and it's providing this nice little runway where they can run from structure to structure. So these things need to be trimmed back. Oh my goodness, this is so bad too. This ran all the way to the top. That's an interstate system above it. So you're giving rodents access to that structure and we're looking close. What's on top of the structure? We see an AC unit, which means water. So now they have a water source. That, and we see that those poles with all those vines go all the way to, to that beam on that interstate run right there. What lives on those interstate beams? Pigeons. So now the rats have a pigeon dinner. They've got a water source, and they've got a building to live in. This, and then look behind it in a picture on the right where, this, where all these vines are growing along this fence behind the structure. So you can't get behind it to service anymore. And it's dark and it's quiet and it's a perfect nesting spot for rats too. So they're actually able to live in the vegetation and not have to go down and burrow. They can build their nest right in there. Because these were nori rats in this situation. And uh, we had this a lot in the city where thankfully we were able to get these, tr these plants trimmed back. And it made a huge difference like night and day. Without habitation or without a, a harborage and a spot for these animals to live, they, they were easy to get rid of. Okay, next. Oh, and that's about it, guys. So we're going to go into summary. Thank you very much. All right, guys, this is Claudia again, just this last slide, and then I'm going to kick it over to Astasia. But I think, you know, Timmy and I talked, sorry about the technical difficulties today, but as you can see, you know, exclusion, which is road improving, is really part of an integrated pest management approach. So Again, it's something that needs to be thought of at the beginning, right? Um, but of course, inspections and sanitation, doing that exclusion really goes hand in hand with population management and then of course our education. So I'm gonna set, turn it over here to Astasia. She's gonna talk a little bit about some of the cool things we're doing with social media that I think you'll, you'll enjoy. So in December 2020, we started um, social media on three platforms, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And we've been sharing not only rodent tips, but mosquito and termite, but we're focusing on rodent today. So on Mondays, on Mondays, we often put out a myth Monday about um, whatever the topic is that day. So for instance, you see one, that gives the three species of commensal rodents. We have one where we have a myth that rats like cheese or mice like cheese. And, you know, we follow that up with a fact that they really, that's not their preference and what they do prefer. So this is just a way that we are able to connect with our residents and other professionals um, around the globe. We also, um, once again, I just want to mention that we have our professional rodent survey. And we're looking to get feedback from industry professionals 
um, so that we can tailor our educational offerings. If you've already taken the survey before, you don't need to retake it, but I placed the link in the chat box. So if you wanna go ahead and take that, we would really appreciate it. Now I wanna open the floor up to questions. I'm gonna check the chat box. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it. The first question I see is, States from the video where the rodent was climbing up the cables, Timmy said she couldn't fit back in the hole that she chewed through. Can you tell the sex of the rodent from the body type? That was a good, let, let's, let me hear that question again. Can I tell the sex of rodent by body type? Uh, yeah, when the rodent was going up through the cable, you said she. Yeah, uh, okay. The, how do I say this politely? Uh, uh, mice, boy mice and rats have very pronounced uh, scrotums uh, to the point where it's very obvious when it's a male and it's mature versus a female. Noticeably bigger. So, yeah, I guess you can. Okay, thank you. Can rats and raccoons coexist in the same areas? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a matter of how much food is available. But it's not that uncommon to see these guys side by side, like I said, eating on a pet food dish at night. It's almost an everyday occurrence. Okay. Rodents eat peppers. Does that mean that online rodent pepper spray formulations don't work for deterring rodents from chewing on surfaces? Uh, there's no scientific data at this point that proves that any of them work. So, and like I said, according to all the biology on the animal, no, they, they, it has no effect on them. So unless there's some new study out there I haven't read yet, if there is, please send it to me. I'd like to learn about it so I could be properly educated. But at this point, no, we have no evidence of them being deterred by pepper. And then we also had a question about bird cages. It says, how do you rodent proof a bird cage that contains live birds? Bird food is always on the cage floor. Birds are always scattering food. Dr. Rigo answered that keeping the cage in the area around it clean will be a top priority. And perhaps you can use a cloth around the bird cage so the seeds do not spill out. And if it's still a problem, you need to go to the envelope of the building and also make sure that the seeds are stored in metal or glass containers. That's the best I have. Someone also, okay. And someone also asked how to view the archived videos. So we also um, just started a YouTube channel. This is Claudia. So we started a YouTube channel actually last week. And um, I think if you just Google YouTube City of New Orleans Mosquito Termite Control, it should take you to it. We're going to be we're actually working on it. So be a little patient. Um, we're uploading some of our previous webinars as well. And so, yeah, we um, I think you have to subscribe to it. There's no charge, uh, but at least it'll give you some notices when there's some cool new things there. OK, I think that's all the questions I see in the chat box. I just want to thank everyone once again for coming to part three of our urban rodent control series. Um, please follow us on social media at NOLA Mosquito. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and now YouTube. And if you want to join our mailing list, please email us at education at NOLA.gov. And once again, just want to mention, mention that pictures of trap station products are for educational purposes only and does not represent an endorsement by New Orleans Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>